Good morning, this is Christy Burcham with Embroidery Online and Oklahoma Embroidery Supply and Design. Um, we are just about to get started here and if those of you who have attended one of our webinars before, um, if one or two of you would mind just dropping a line in the question box to make sure our audio is working properly, that always helps us to make sure the audio is getting out to the audience. Great, I see a couple of you have responded to that already. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this morning, we're talking about embroidering ready to wear. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we're very excited to go through this presentation with you. I want to let you know the presentation is being recorded, so it will be available to you after the session is over. Before we get into the presentation itself, we'll go over just a few housekeeping things that will help the presentation to be um, as valuable as possible to you. When you're looking at your screen, you're going to see two main areas of your screen. As you can see here is an example screen on the left-hand side. You will see the Go to Webinar Viewer. That's where you'll actually see the presentation itself. That can be made bigger by clicking and dragging this little corner, the little triangle that you see here. You can click and drag that to enlarge it. You can also maximize this screen by using the Maximize button, and that will take up the full screen. That way you can see a bigger version of the presentation if you prefer. Maybe just a second, I'm putting the question box over here so I can see it a little bit better. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, you're going to see the GoToWebinar user interface. Let me go to the next slide and show you a little bit more about that interface. You can open and close that interface by using the little orange arrow. The orange arrow will open or close it, um, just depending on whichever it toggles it back and forth. And in that orange arrow, you're going to see, first of all, you can choose to call in by telephone. If you have any trouble with the audio during the presentation, you can try calling in by telephone. Um, it is not a toll-free number, so I would recommend using a cell phone if you have a cell phone available so you don't have... Um, or if you have a cell phone with no long distance charges, uh, you might want to try that. But preferably for most of us, the mic and speakers option will be what we use. And that's so you can hear through your computer. Now underneath that, you'll see the questions box. This will be where you can enter questions for the presenter. Um, and I will be checking those questions throughout the presentation. I'll pause a couple of times to answer your questions. Um, but most of the questions will probably get answered at the end of the session. However, do feel free to enter questions any time throughout the presentation, and I'll try to get to them as we can. Um, to enter the question, you simply type in the box that says Enter Question for Staff and click Send. Your question will only be shown to me, um, but then I will repeat the question to the audience before answering it so everyone knows um, what question is being answered. Uh, but your, your personal information is not being shared there, so it's safe to enter a question and hit send, and then I'll address those questions as we go through the session. To let you know who I am, my name's Christy Burcham. Um, I am the presenter. Uh, my position here at Embroidery Online, actually, I'm the marketing manager. Um, so I do a lot of the um, promotions and uh, activities that you see us doing, including things like this uh, webinar. Um, I have 18 years uh, experience teaching machine embroidery. Um, and yes, I did start when I was really young. Um, but I have been doing machine embroidery um, since I was about 16 years old, and I love it. Um, I have been with Embroidery Online for nine years, and um, I have two adorable kids, as you can see. Uh, but most importantly for this session, I'm really passionate about machine embroidery, so I'm excited to share some ideas with you. I hope you gain a lot from today's presentation. Now, we'll be talking about a number of different things and a number of different types of embroidering ready-to-wear projects. This particular dress will be our, kind of our focus project, so we'll use it to explain some concepts that can be applied to a lot of different types of projects. Um, so I just wanted you to see a before, and when we get to the end of the presentation, you'll see the finished product. When it comes to embroidering ready to wear, one of the things that makes it a little bit scary is the fact that the garment is already constructed. And so we're looking at this garment and we're thinking, can we really stitch it? You know, we've got seams, facings, linings, narrow things like sleeves and pants legs. 
uh, pockets, and then multiple layers of fabric. So we have all of these things that become sort of obstacles to us to actually embroidering on the project. Um, but what I want to tell you is, yes, you can stitch through all of these things. You can stitch over seams. You can stitch through facings. You can stitch through linings. You can stitch on narrow items like sleeves and pants legs. Uh, you can do pockets, and you can stitch through multiple layers of fabric. Uh, but in order to do all of these things, you may have to, to take a few extra steps to make them work. Um, there will be some items you won't be able to embroider. There will be some areas that will be too tough. But most of the time, you can find a way to do it if you're really determined to get that embroidery on that project. Let's start with this uh, type of a project, um, something like a coat, a blazer, or another aligned item. Um, anytime you've got something that's fully lined, like this wool coat is fully lined, it is usually going to be easiest to try to stitch through that lining as opposed to trying to take it apart. Sometimes we will recommend that you cut open the lining and then go into the project and stitch it and then sew the lining all back together. But when you've got something that's fully lined, that can be a really challenging project and it will involve, oh, pardon me, let me just uh, adjust here. Sorry about that. Let me get my mouse back. Okay. Okay, we're back. Um, anyway, back to putting it back together, putting that lining back together. It can involve a lot of hand stitching when it goes to putting it back together. So I don't know about you, but I like to avoid as much hand stitching as possible. So what we want to do is to... Um, in this case, we're going to stitch through the layers. If you're going to stitch through all the layers, including the lining, what I'm going to recommend is that you um, don't hoop it. And the reason that I recommend not hooping it if you're going to stitch through the lining is what I've seen happen too many times is on a project like this, we might try to actually hoop this, all the layers and the lining. And then as we go to hoop it, our tendency is to kind of pull that fabric to make it taut. And what happens if we pull the lining and the, the top fabric taut, um, and then they get stitched together, when we take it out of the hoop, that lining that got pulled taut is now no longer lined up properly. And then it's going to cause bunching in other areas because it's been stitched into the garment, but it wasn't completely lined up perfectly. So it's really hard to try to stitch the lining and the garment together um, when you've got something that's fully lined like that. So instead of trying to hoop it, um, what I would recommend is go ahead and you're going to hoop your stabilizer first and then you're going to put the, the project on top of it. And we'll look at a couple examples of that later. Um, but before you do it, when you're going to be stitching something that's lined like this, base the layers together. So place it onto your sewing machine and use a long basting stitch or use a hand basting stitch and just put several basting um, stitches in the area where the embroidery is going to be, basting that lining to the garment before you start stitching so that the lining doesn't shift while you're doing the embroidery. Um, because if that lining shifts, it will cause problems when you uh, stitch it out. Now, another thing that you'll want to consider when you're going to be stitching on something like this, where it's a, um, in this case, it's a fairly uh, dense fabric, and we're stitching through the lining too, is that we don't want to put too many stitches into it. Um, that can make it a little harder to stitch, and we want to have a project that um, is going to be easy to stitch and doesn't have too many. Uh, so something you can do is you can choose designs that look like they have a full fill, but actually have a light fill. And as you can see, a little bit of the the cherry or the mulberry red of this jacket actually shows through um, the fills in these leaves, just a, sh a shade of it. Um, and that's because these actually are a light fill, um, but they have enough of an area to them in the way the stitches are set that you still get the full impact. And I'm going to show you a close-up of one of those leaves. You can see what I'm talking about. 
So you want to look for designs like this where you can get the full color impact, but you're still having a very light fill. So that way you're not having too many stitches you're having to put through all of those layers of fabric. So when you're going to hoop these items that you can't actually put the whole thing into the hoop, typically what we recommend is that you're going to hoop the stabilizer first and then place the item onto the stabilizer. And you have a couple of choices here. You can either use an adhesive stabilizer, which would uh, be like a paper-backed adhesive where you peel away the paper, or you can use any stabilizer, stabilizer of your choice and use an adhesive spray. I typically use an adhesive spray, and the reason I do is that gives me a lot more options. There are um, about three or four different types of adhesive stabilizers that have a peel away paper backing, um, but there are many, many, many types of, of other types of stabilizers. So by using the adhesive spray, I can choose any stabilizer that's appropriate for my fabric and then just use the adhesive spray. So um, when you're using that um, adhesive spray, you do want to choose a spray that's really going to stick. So you want to be sure you test your adhesive spray as you're working with it to make sure it really will stick well to the project that you're working on. Some machines do have a basting stitch that you can use in addition to that adhesive spray. And if your embroidery machine has that option, be sure to use it. Um, but I will caution you that it won't, you can't always use that basting stitch. And I'll show you why in a little bit. Another option is to use a specialty hoop. Um, there are some hoops out there that use magnets that allow you to place an item that you might not normally be able to hoop um, by hooping it with a magnet. Um, so you can look for tools like that that can help you um, with some of the types of projects that you can't hoop in a traditional way. As we start to work into some of these more difficult areas like pants legs, um, in some items that are lined, um, or pockets, you may have to do some unassembly or some unstitching in order to do the embroidery. Um, if you're talking about uh, sleeves or pants legs, unless you're putting it just at the bottom of the pants leg and the pants leg is a fairly wide hem, most of the time you're going to have to take out one of the seams. So when you're going to take out a seam, you always want to look for the seam that will be easiest to replace. Um, you have to consider also where you can get to the embroidery, but sometimes taking out the seam that's closest to the embroidery is actually not the best choice. Um, think about a pair of jeans. And if you've got a pair of jeans, you've got a flat fell seam, sometimes just on one side, and a regular seam on the other side. It's much easier to replace the regular seam than the flat fell seam. So even if the flat fell seam is closer to the embroidery, sometimes it's easier to take out the other side, and then you can flatten the, the jeans leg and do your embroidery. And that way it's easier to stitch back together. So let's look at an example of a project where we're going to have to do some unstitching in order to do the embroidery. Um, in this case, it's going to be a jeans pocket. And when you're doing a jeans pocket, a back pocket of jeans, you actually have some options. You don't have to take it off. Um, you could stitch through both layers. Now keep in mind if you're going to stitch through both layers, that's a pretty heavy amount of stitching you're asking your machine to do because you're going through two layers of denim. And in some cases, more if you're going to be stitching over any of the seams of the pocket. Um, but it is possible. Do you remember, though, if you stitch through both layers, the pocket will no longer be usable because you've stitched it together. So keep that in mind, too, when you're choosing whether to try to stitch through the pocket or to take it off. Um, another option is to remove the pocket altogether and then stitch the pocket uh, separately and put it back onto the jeans. That's another option. Now, if those pockets are attached with grommets or maybe some reinforcement stitching at the top, that may not be the option you want to choose either because then you'd have to put those grommets back or take them out, which can be very difficult to do. So the third option is what we're going to do, which is to partially remove the pocket. So sometimes when you're working on a project, this could be a jeans pocket, but you could do the same thing with a lapel pocket, is you can remove the pocket part way, and that will save you some of the work of stitching it back together. So let's take a look. This is the jeans pocket we're going to be working on, and we're going to unstitch the pocket starting at the bottom point. It's usually best to start at the bottom um, and then work your way back up. 
You can use whatever kind of seam ripper you like. Um, I use a seam fix seam ripper, and you'll see why in just a minute. That's that's my personal favorite. Um, but in this case, the there are actually two rows of stitching that have to be removed. So we're going to start by taking out that bottom point. It's usually the easiest place, and then start working our way up. As we remove, though, notice that we are not going to take the stitching out at the reinforced edge because we're only partially removing the pocket. So we're going to remove the stitching all the way up to where the reinforced stitching starts, and then we're going to stop and leave that reinforced stitching in place. Now, in this case, this stitching isn't too intense. We actually could probably take it completely off. But this can save you a lot of time by leaving these reinforced stitches in place. That way you can just stitch back the regular stitching. You don't have to worry about that. Now, before you start doing any embroidery, I really recommend that you take away any of these little excess threads, both on the pocket itself and on the jeans. Um, when you leave the threads in place, if you don't really do a good cleanup before you start the embroidery, they can get caught in the embroidery. And it seems like you'll be able to just brush them away, but it's too easy to get distracted and forget to look and let those end up getting stitched into your design. So make sure that you use a... Um, a brush of some sort to remove those little pieces, or if you're using that seam fix seam ripper, it has kind of a little rubbery end that you can rub across those loose stitches and it'll just pull them right out and it kind of speeds up that process. Now you can see we've pulled the pocket completely off except for the top reinforcements. And I've marked the center where I want my embroidery. Let me get the highlighter here because you can just barely see that there. But we marked the center right here. We want the embroidery to go. Now you can see in this particular pocket that there is a big stitch right across the middle of it. Depending on what you're going to do, you may want to take this out if you've got a really decorative stitch that's going to get in the way, or you can stitch over it. For my particular project, I just stitched over it. Um, but you may want to take it out. And how you decide whether you can stitch over this or not is going to depend on what you're putting on top of it. So if you're going to put a full fill design on top of that, you probably don't want to stitch over a thick stitch like this with a full stitch design. There's too much thickness for the machine to go through when you stitch that design. Um, but the design I'm going to place on here is more of an outline type design. So it only has to cross this thick stitch it in a, stitches in a few places. So consider the project you're going to be doing whether you have to take that decorative stitching off. If you know you're going to be embroidering the jeans when you buy them, then you might look at that and see when you're choosing the jeans to be sure that you choose one that's going to have that decorative stitch that's not too hard to take out or that's not going to interfere with your design. Sometimes there's just a little simple V, and those are fairly easy. If it's just a simple V that's a single row of stitching, you should be able to stitch over that with no problem, um, even with a heavy design. Let me erase my markings here. OK, now we're going to place this onto the stabilizer. So we've hooped the stabilizer first. I've sprayed it with an adhesive spray. And then I've placed my pocket onto my stabilizer. Now, I marked the center of my hoop on my stabilizer, and I have the center of my design marked on my pocket, and I'm going to line those two up together. One little trick that I use that helps me quite a bit in getting those two lined up is I'll often stick a straight pin right into the middle of that mark that I've marked on my pocket, and then I will um, put my, stab my hoop stabilizer onto a pinnable surface, like a little pressing board. And then as I'm laying one onto the other, I use that pin to target right into the mark that I've made onto my stabilizer, just to kind of help me uh, pin that into place, and then I can adjust and get that pocket laid on straight. Next, we're going to stitch the design. So as you can see, this design that I'm working on here, it stitches over that line, but it's not too much uh, for it to go through because the stitches that I'm adding are just outline stitches. And once you've finished stitching your design, you're going to stitch the pocket back into place. And with jeans pockets, it makes it very easy because you usually have a dark um, area that didn't get the... Uh, the rinse that you can see as you're stitching it back in place. 
with other types of projects, you may, may or may not have quite as good of a line to follow, but you can usually follow the stitched holes um, to stitch your pocket back into place. One thing to consider when you're deconstructing and reconstructing a garment for embroidery is take advantage of the fact that you took it apart. So for example, when we took this pocket apart and stitched it back together, we added orange for the thread to match the embroidery. So we've got orange that I'm stitching the pocket back with. And then I also added some decorative stitches onto the pocket as I stitched it back together. So you've taken that pocket off anyway. You might as well take an advantage of that and add some more to it. Now what if you just, um, you can't hoop it like we did with this pocket, um, and maybe you, you can't even partially hoop it. Another option is that you could applique uh, another piece of fabric and then place that applique onto your project. Um, and you can either do this by matching the fabric that you're going to place it onto there, or you could make it um, a contrasting fabric. I'll show you an example. Uh, here's a t-shirt that we did, and with the t-shirt, you know, some of the designs were able to stitch directly onto the t-shirt. Um, and actually, this one could have been stitched directly onto the t-shirt, but instead we stitched it on another piece of fabric, and then applique that fabric onto the project that you're working on. With some projects, you can't get them in the hoop, but you might be able to get them under your sewing machine needle to just stitch the applique down or you could hand stitch that applique down if you had to. When you're doing this, again, since you're going to be doing an applique anyway, you may want to consider making it a decorative element. In this case, we stitched this down in um, sort of an asymmetrical shape and then fringed off the extra um, from the applique. So you can really experiment with different ways to add an applique embroidered fabric um, when you just simply cannot hoop the project. One of the um, most important things when it comes to embroidering ready to wear is to place the embroidery in the right place. Um, one of the things you'll need to do to make this work properly is to use a template. And in just a moment, I'll show you how to print a template. Um, when you're determining the placement and you're using your templates to decide where to place your stitching, you need to remember what the embroidery is going to look like when it's on the wearer, not just how it looks flat. And that's where a lot of us go wrong, is we lay the project out flat, we put our templates on it, and we're so pleased with the layout. Then we stitch it, and we put it on. And we find that it doesn't quite land where we thought it would when it was flat. Um, and that's because our bodies are not flat. So we really need to determine, where is that embroidery going to go on the user? Um, the most commonly asked placement uh, question that I get is, where do you put the left chest design? How do you know you've got that placed right? And there are a ton of tools out there to help you with this. Um, I'll just give you a couple of basic guidelines. When you're placing an embroidery or a logo over the left chest, you want to imagine the hand over the heart. So you want that embroidery to go right over the heart. Um, and that's going to be different for different people where that ends up on the garment itself. But you, there is a basic guideline that works for most of the time. So if you're not able to try it on the actual user to get it perfect, you can use this basic rule of thumb. And that is, if you take where the shoulder, um, if you have a shoulder seam, you can use the shoulder seam. But for example, this shirt that doesn't have a shoulder seam because it has the dropped seam. So if you take where the shoulder meets the neckline, let me turn on my pen here. Take where the shoulder meets the neckline, so that would be right here, and come straight down. That should be the vertical center of your design. Now, where should the horizontal center be? Again, remember, hand over the heart, so it should be right about where the heart is but we want to put it usually about halfway down the arm side. Now again, this shirt doesn't have a traditional arm side, so we can't just take from the top to bottom of arm side and measure halfway. But you can imagine where a typical armhole would be from here to here, and about halfway down, that's typically where that design's going to go. Now there's all kinds of guides you can find that will give you measurements, that exact measurement, and there are also some tools that you can use that are little L brackets that will help you get that exact placement. Ideally, whenever possible, when you're placing something, have the person who's going to wear it 
try it on and use that to determine your placement because everyone's body is different. So just because it works on a standard template doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work on the wearer. Um, but you can use this as a general rule of thumb if you're not able to do that. Go back here. Now, what if you're going to put the design in the center of a t-shirt or sweatshirt or project like that? Um, it's going to be, of course, centered. That's pretty easy. But how high up or down should it go? Usually, uh, designs are going to be in the, kind of the upper chest area, but you have to consider who's going to be wearing it. So for children, the designs on a children's t-shirt normally end up more in the center of the t-shirt, kind of across their belly um, a little bit more than they do up high across the chest. So again, think about who's going to be wearing it and where you want that to land. Um, as a place to start, halfway down the arm side, again, is usually a pretty good place for the center of the design. And then it depends on how... Um, it depends on how big that design is, whether you may need to adjust up or down based on that. But you can usually start by taking that armhole, going about halfway down, and that's a pretty good starting place for the center, and then adjust based on your design. One of the things that I do when I'm determining placement, there are some tr traditional places that we put designs, but I'm trying to be creative with something, is I will use fashion magazines um, and other pictures as an inspiration for placement. Um, we all think to use uh, Pinterest and other areas as inspiration for projects, but sometimes we don't think about that just as an idea of where should I put the design. So for example, you can use Pinterest and just search the term embroidered whatever you're going to be embroidering. So I'll give you an example here. I've got Pinterest pulled up. And let's say I want to do a blazer. We can type in embroidered blazer. And what that's going to give you is lots of ideas for different places you could put embroidery. Because we think about embroidering a blazer, and maybe the first thing you think is, well, I could do the lapels. Um, and like what this one has, the lapels. But what I wouldn't have thought to do is to do the lapel and a little bit of the sleeve. So I love using Pinterest for this because it helps me get more ideas for where the embroidery should go on a project. And it really helps me think through. Um, for example, here we're doing the bodice of the jacket as opposed to the lapel. And then the lapel goes over the bodice. So you can get lots of great ideas just for embroidery placement by using Pinterest or other magazine or web searches to help you decide where the embroidery should go. Now, what about choosing the right design for your garment? Of course, the design type is going to depend on where you put it. If you're going to have something that's running down a skirt, you probably want a lighter, more airy design than something that you might put in on the left chest design. Uh, for garments, in general, we're choosing designs that have lighter fills, um, designs with lots of open areas, so that the fabric is going to continue to drape over the body. So when you have a really heavy design, that doesn't usually drape as well as a design that's more open and has some open areas in it. However, there are, of course, some major exceptions to that, and that is yokes, the back uh, yoke, um, jacket backs, and chest design, so left chest or center chest designs, you can definitely go heavier in those areas um, than you can in other parts of a project. Here are a few collections that I've gathered that are just good examples of collections that work well as garments, and they were designed specifically um, or at least partially in mind of doing garments with them. And you can see some common factors that there are a lot of open areas as opposed to heavy fills and swirly elements that allow you to create movement in your project and combine elements together. Now, there are always exceptions to the rule. So we say we want to use open, airy designs, but you can look at this example, this wrap dress, 
we use the designs Magnolia and Fleur. And you can see these are very solid fill. They have quite a few stitches. Um, it's a pretty heavy design that we've used. But we've used some swirly elements, which actually are included in this collection, to help still create movement and give some lighter areas to it. Do keep in mind, though, if you're going to do a project like this where you have some very heavy areas to it, that those areas are not going to drape. They're going to be a little heavier. They're going to be more solid. So, for example, where we've got them placed here, that section of the skirt is all going to kind of move as one because it's uh, got that chunky embroidery on it. So just keep that in mind when you're placing the embroidery. What about choosing the right stabilizer for your project? When you're choosing a stabilizer for a ready-to-wear project, you want to choose the stabilizer based on the fabric and the design. First of all, look at the fabric. If the fabric stretches, use a cutaway. That's the most simple rule of thumb um, that I have followed, and it really has helped me to create more successful embroidery, and that is if the fabric stretches, use a cutaway. Not whether it's knit or not, but whether it stretches. Um, because if the fabric stretches and we use anything other than a cutaway, as the fabric stretches when it's being washed, if we've got embroidery on it, that embroidery will stretch too. <coughs> Pardon me. So we want to um, choose a cutaway. So what would be some examples of a woven fabric that stretch? Anything with lycra added to it is going to have a stretch to it, so you want to choose a cutaway for those fabrics. Denim does stretch considerably, as we all know. Um, later in the day, when we put our jeans on, they're a lot more comfortable, um, and that's because that denim stretches quite a bit, even if it doesn't have lycra. So cutaway is going to be best on a stretchy fabric, including denim. The next thing that I always consider after I determine whether it stretches or not is the delicateness of the delicacy, hmm, not sure of the right word there, uh, of the fabric, how delicate the fabric is. Um, the more delicate the fabric is, the softer stabilizer you want to use with it. So if you're going to do a really lightweight knit, you want to use a softer tearaway, you, uh, pardon me, a softer cutaway like a poly mesh um, that's a mesh stabilizer that's going to be soft and drape with the fabric. If you use a stiff um, cutaway with a soft drapey knit, those two aren't going to be compatible with one another. So you want to, as often as possible, match the hand of the fabric to the hand of your stabilizer. There'll be some exceptions, but the heavier the, sta the fabric, the heavier stabilizer you can use. The lighter the fabric, the more fabric-like your stabilizer needs to feel. In some cases, there are some knits that there is an exception to being able to use a cutaway stabilizer, and that is if you're using a tissue knit or something very, very soft, you'll probably have to use a wash-away stabilizer. Um, those fabrics are just so soft that they really can't tolerate any kind of um, stabilizer that stays with the fabric. The next question I always ask myself is, do I need all the stabilizer to be gone? And of course, the simple question is, uh, if, I, if I've got to have all the stabilizer gone when I'm done, I've got to use a wash away. That's the only stabilizer. Um, tear away is tear away most of it, but there will always be some left in the design. So if I need everything to go away, I need to use a wash away stabilizer. Um, next, how many stitches are in my design? The more stitches in the design, the heavier that stabilizer needs to be in order to support all of those stitches. And then finally, does that fabric have a thick texture or a nap to it? If there's a texture or a nap of any sort, we want to use a topping. I do occasionally even use a topping on a denim because denim has a twill weave and sometimes stitches have a tendency to kind of fall into that twill weave and then they get lost. You don't really see them as well. So putting a, a topping stabilizer on top, so a water-soluble topping, will help keep the stitches lifted while it's doing the embroidery. And then it tears away, and now you've created enough of a lift in those designs, that in those stitches, that they will be up kind of above floating over your um, your design. Another example where you need to use a topping is anything with a terry cloth, um, velour, anything with a nap to it. Um, also, sweater knits, anything that has that texture, you want to use a water-soluble topping with those. 
Some other types of designs that you can use um, as we start to move into our feature project are couture collections. So far we have two of these couture collections and these were designed specifically for embroidering on garments. Now they can be used for other things but they really had, um, our artist and digitizer had garments in mind when they designed them. And so there were two things that they did when they put these together. Um, they wanted to be able to create a design that had a bold splash of color, but that would work well even on lighter fabrics. So those bold areas of color that you see, the bright red areas, are actually applique. And by using applique instead of fill stitches, that creates a much lighter stitch count and allows you to choose a fabric that is appropriate for the base fabric that you're working with so that you can create the right amount of um, texture for that fabric so it's not too light, not too heavy for the fabric you're working with. And then the second thing that they looked at was in addition to that bold splash of color was to create those that movement that you often want to see in a garment project. So you can see that the layer that's added over the top is um, a really nice uh, almost looks like a cording when you stitch it out. The stitches are very very short on these uh, white areas and that gives it the appearance of a cording. So it gives it more of a fashion look. The first one that came out was Floral Couture and it was a red, white, and black um, color combination. But these were designed specifically to be able to easily change the colors to match your project. We do have a project of a skirt for this Floral Couture project and we do have a PDF for this you can download from EmbroideryOnline.com and I just wanted to show you that area of Embroidery Online. We have a projects area and in the projects area there's two sections that you can use. There's the instructions area and the inspirations area. If you go to the instructions area you will see projects where you actually have a PDF you can download and this skirt is one of them. This was actually featured in the Designs and Machine Embroidery Newsletter and they were gracious enough to allow us to also uh, distribute this PDF. So you can download that PDF and you'll have the instructions that will walk you step by step through creating a project like that. And there's even an alternate project here. And that's found in our projects area. In the projects area we also have the inspirations area. Sometimes you need instructions and sometimes you just need inspirations and that's what the inspirations area provides. With the inspirations there are no instructions for these projects but they give you ideas on where or how you might use designs, how you might use a specific design but also just different placement and project ideas. So that Magnolia dress we looked at was from this project inspirations and you can see some other project ideas here. Here's another example of using a design. This actually goes across the seam. So it goes just fine over the seam, um, but using it in different areas of a garment. So use those project instructions and inspirations area to help you get ideas. The collection that we'll be using for our dress that we're looking at today is the Garden Couture and it is 12461. It's a, a new collection. You can see that it's got some similarities to the other. It still uses the applique and then that uh, layer of stitching over, um, but with a little bit brighter flowers, more of a spring flower, and we've also got a butterfly and a sparrow, some other additional designs in this collection. These collections do have a specific color palette, so this one was a yellow and green but we will be using a different color palette, a col coral and mint. And this is actually a thread collection that we offer. Um, we use color forecasting to determine what colors will be in our thread collections. So if you're ever just needing some color palette ideas, you can check out our Timeless Thread Kits section. And if you look at these kits, these color kits are actually colors that we have done some color forecasting in red um, and red were looked into some various uh, fashion forecasting and if you've been shopping lately you've seen that coral and mint is everywhere so you can see some other color combinations that you can try with your projects so coral and mint is what we're going to be doing our project with now in order to do this project we need to be able to print templates and 
we, you can print your own templates from your own embroidery software, but if you don't have an embroidery software to print templates with, you can use Artsizer. And Artsizer is a free program that we offer. If you'll find it on our website under software, and just go to OESD Artsizer, and you'll see this link here, and you just click the free download button. And that'll download the zip file, and then you just install it from there. It's a really simple um, install. It's just one file that you're actually downloading, and it'll install it. And I'm going to open that art sizer up here and show you just really quick how to print a template with this software. The software will open ART format, which is the format that we digitize in. Um, so that's our uh, recommended and preferred format because when you use an art file that's a format that we've digitized you're working in its native language. However the software will also open most other um, embroidery formats and it will save to most embroidery formats. So you can work with the majority of design types with this design with this software. So let's open up a design and we can change the view here to an artistic view so we can see the stitches. Now, to print a template, it's really pretty simple. We go to print, and before we print, we want to choose a preview. Now, by default, this software is set up to automatically print the center points for you. Um, so you can see here, when we print this out, by default, this is going to print at 100% size with the center point set. This will give you the template you'll need to be able to create your designs and to, to place your designs, which we'll see how to actually use the printouts in a moment. Just in case for some reason you've changed the default settings, you can go to options here and just make sure you have it set to actual size and you make sure that you have start and end crosshairs turned on. If we turn those off, you'll see that it does not print the center point. So you want to be sure you have those turned on and it's centered there. Now one other thing I will show you is that in this software you can change the start and end points. By default it should start and end at the center of the design. That's going to be the default. You can change this to the first and last stitch of the design and occasionally you may come across a design where it comes into the software that way. So when we go to print this you can see that because the start and end crosshairs, since we're not starting and ending in the center, that doesn't give me the center point for the design. Now there may be times that it would be helpful to you to be able to print the start point and the end point of the design. Um, but in this case, we really are wanting the center of the design. So we'll go back, arrange, start and end, and be sure that we're having it auto start and end at the center of the design. And now we can print this design to get our center points. You may occasionally find, too, that when you're printing these designs, particularly if you have a white design with a lot of white stitching in it, when you go to print it, it may not be dark enough for you to print it. Even if you print it in grayscale, sometimes you really can't see the stitches because the color for those stitches was too light. You can change thread colors in this design, in this software, using settings and going to thread colors, and you can reassign the thread colors. There are a number of thread charts built into the software here. Um, I use the timeless thread, so we'll use that timeless thread chart, but you can see that most of the major brands of thread are included. And then we can reassign a darker color and in this case, I'll just do it to all of them. So when I print this, now the design's much darker. So that'll be a little easier to see when I print it out. Um, you don't always have to do that. In fact, with this design, I probably would have been fine without changing the colors in order to print it. But it does help um, sometimes, especially if those stitches are white, that you may need to change the colors in order to print a really good template. You can also use that feature, of course, just to see how a design is going to look in different colors. All right, we'll go ahead and close this design. I'm not going to save the changes, but you can with, the, with this software. You can save the changes. You can size the design, rotate it, mirror image it, and do some other really basic changes to it, and then save that as a new file. But in this case, we're not going to save it. 
Okay, now that we know how to create our templates, again, we might have to change the thread colors, we're going to print them out. Now, when I print these out, I will number them and put an arrow up because I'm going to cut these out to start placing them onto my project. So I need to remember which way is up on these printouts as I start working with them. So I will usually write the number of the design or some other uh, indication so when I go back to stitch it out I know which design I'm talking about. And then an arrow to indicate um, which way is up. Also, in some cases I might be using the same design more than once but sometimes I'm mirror imaging it. So if I'm using the mirror, if this printout is the mirror imaged version, I'll mark that with an M, just so I know which one I'm working with. Now, if you are going to be, let me get back to that slide here. If you're going to um, mark this with chalk or another type of marker, you want to slice the template right at those X points and flip them back so you can actually access the fabric underneath and then mark. So here we've marked the template and when I mark it, I will mark it with the chalk and then I'll write the number so I'll remember which, one was, which design was supposed to go here and then also the orientation, which way was up. Now there are also these really cool little tools. Here's the before uh, project. I'm going to show you another thing you can do in just a second instead of marking it with chalk. So again, here's our dress and we're going to place these templates on it. Now remember I said earlier that we want to think about when we're placing the designs, not just how it's going to look flat, but how it's going to look on. If you have the luxury of having a dress form um, that fits the, you or the person that you're uh, working on, you might want to actually put the garment onto the dress form as you start to place the embroidery, um, which is what I did in this case. So I placed it onto the dress form and then I started taping the templates in place when I decided I thought I knew where I wanted them to be. This is a really cool little tool I started to tell you about a second ago. These are called Target Stickers, and they're available um, from Designs and Machine Embroidery, and I am in love with these. So instead of actually marking the template with a uh, pen or a, a piece of chalk, you actually place this sticker on your finger, and you place it underneath that template, and then you just stick it down onto the project exactly where the center is going to go. And as you can see, it does have an orientation arrow on it so you can know which direction you're going. And then you can grab a little Sharpie and even mark the number right onto that um, little sticker so you know which design goes there as well. So we start marking the center. Now, with a project like this, when I'm using these target stickers, I'm gonna, I want these to be mirror images of each other because notice I have this seam here. So I need to be sure I'm keeping lined up with this seam. So m use your measuring tools as needed. Um, I'm not doing a very good job here with this because I took this picture myself. But you want to measure from your center of your target to the center of your project so that as you put your target sticker or mark your center on the other side, you're sure that you're keeping it even across both sides of the garment. Now you can see I've got all of my target stickers placed and I'm ready to start stitching this project. First I hoop the stabilizer. The stabilizer I used for this dress, um, this is just a typical polyester blend um, that you would see in most um, garment construction. Uh, it's pretty commonly uh, seen in ready to wear. Um, I'm going to use a heavy tearaway stabilizer. And the reason I chose a heavy tearaway stabilizer um, is because the fabric was fairly dense. It's not a really super delicate fabric. And also I wanted to be able to just use one layer. So I just used one layer of a heavy tearaway. This is actually a tearaway um, wash away. So it doesn't dissolve, but it does get very soft when you wash it. So even though it's crisp when I stitch it, it becomes soft as we uh, wash it. Now we mark the center of the hoop with a pencil just like we have done in uh, previous projects here. But you're going to mark the center of the hoop and then spray this with an adhesive spray. Let me recommend that whenever you're spraying your projects within your hoop that you use some sort of a guard to protect your hoop. 
You can use uh, a, p a nice big piece of cardstock or cardboard that has a center cut out to protect your hoop, but lay something over your hoop to keep yourself from spraying onto that hoop. You can always clean the hoop, but it takes a lot of extra time and effort, and you want to keep that hoop looking nice and working nice. So protect that hoop whenever you can by using some sort of a shield to protect it. Now, if placing the first center point um, in the center of the hoop. And I started with the center chest design um, because that is kind of layered under some of the other designs. So that's the one we started first. We want to make sure that the arrow that you're, you've either marked or the top arrow of your target sticker is pointing in the correct direction um, for the way you've got the hoop oriented. You can always flip the way the design fits in the hoop when you get it onto the machine, but you want to make sure because sometimes the design only fits in one direction. So just make sure you lay it on there correctly. Um, you can ask me later how I know you need to double check you've got it oriented correctly before you start stitching. Now with this center chest design, um, I only had one little part of the facing that I needed to worry about, but when you go to stitch this, make sure that facing is out of the way. Because this was not a fully lined dress, we needed to just make sure that facing was flipped out. We certainly don't want to happen as one little corner of that facing to get stuck under the embroidery. Um, and then it, the dress becomes um, distorted because part of that facing is stitched into the project. So make sure the facing is flipped out of the way. You're going to place it on the machine and then make sure that your center point's lined up with the center of your design and then stitch the design. Now as you're stitching, make sure your other center points don't come off. And whether it's chalk or marker or these target stickers, whatever you're using, it can come off as you're stitching. So just kind of babysit those other target uh, stickers or marker, markers. Um, another tool that I sometimes use is actually a heat sensitive pen that goes away with ironing. And that one's usually the best about not coming off while you're doing your other designs. Now, to do the designs up near the top of the shoulders, the facing in that shoulder seam, I could not flip it inside out enough in order to get the design flat. So what I actually did, and this comes down to our having to deconstruct sometimes, is I just split that facing uh, right up the center of that shoulder area. So you can see I just cut it right up the middle. It was too narrow. But in order to stitch it, I really needed to flip it out. Now, if the facing had been um, far enough down over the dress that I could have embroidered through the facing, I might have considered doing that. But in this case, it would have been part of the embroidery was stitched through two layers and part of it on one layer, and I just didn't want to take that chance. So instead, we went ahead and split it open. This allowed us, as we go to place this onto the next uh, designed to actually flip that facing out and place just the dress fabric onto the hoop. Now, when I'm stitching this narrow shoulder area, and you can kind of see this is the neck seam here and this is the armhole. There are some areas where that fabric is naturally going to want to kind of flip in and fold in and get under your needle. So in, when you're doing something as close or as narrow as this, you will have to babysit it. This is not the kind of project you can walk away from. Um, it's really tempting to use your fingers to hold that fabric out of the way. Let me recommend to never do that. Do not hold that fabric out of the way with your fingers. You can ask me later how I know. You should not hold it out of the way with your fingers. Um, use a pencil or a chopstick, ideally a chopstick, because a chopstick is going to um, hold it out of the way, but if it does happen to catch under your needle, it's not likely to cause much damage to your needle or your machine because it'll break easily. Um, so that way you, you're keeping everything out of the way without um, keeping your, uh, without getting your fingers in danger. Okay, now my, when my design's completely done, I'm going to tear away all this excess stabilizer, and I'm going to kind of place the facing back into place, and then I'm going to put this back together, and what I do is use a little strip of fusible interfacing, place the fusible side facing me um, toward the inside of this facing, and slide it up in there so that it covers the entire slit that I've got and then press that into place to kind of hold everything together. And as you're doing that, you want to make sure that those two pieces that you've split open just touch each other. 
as you're um, putting them onto the face onto the uh, fusible interfacing. You don't want them to overlap at all. Um, if they overlap, what will happen is you'll pull the fabric tighter and you'll have um, your fabric will kind of bunch up because the facing isn't flat. So make sure that as you're fusing it, it's really flat. Um, so then you're going to press that in place and then once you've got it pressed flat, just butt it up next to each other, you can whip stitch that closed through the facing layer, the interfacing layer that you've fused into place. And now um, that that's going to be hidden and not show, and even though it's not as pretty as it would have been um, if you'd made the garment from scratch as far as how it looks on the inside, uh, most people aren't looking on the inside of the dress. We're looking at the outside. So this is what it looks like when we were all finished. Now you'll notice that there are designs. We had the center design. There are actually four designs here, two here in the center and two more. You'll notice that you may remember I actually had two more designs planned to come down across the center of this bodice. Uh, but what I found is when I finished this, I was really pleased with how it looks. And one of the things I've learned when it comes to embroidering, to embroidering ready to wear is once you think, wow, that looks good, don't put any more on it. You're done. Um, it's a whole lot easier to add more later than it is to take something out. So when you get to a point that you're satisfied, stop. And be uh, nobody has to know that you originally planned to do a little bit more than you did. So you can see this is one version of the finished dress, and then here's another picture that our photographer took um, of that finished dress. Uh, just a side note, you may be wondering about this little necklace. This is a freestanding lace sparrow design, and actually through today, today's the last day, um, that freestanding lace sparrow design is actually free when you purchase this Garden Couture collection. But you also can purchase that design separately. So um, we've kind of wrapped up the, the tips and projects that I had to show you, but what I'd like to do is to take some time. Um, we're finishing up here, just about to the end of our hour, but I'll be on for a few minutes. I'd like to know what projects you're stitching on that you need advice. What are you working on that you're thinking about stitching and you can't quite figure out how you want to put it together? And then I'll also address any other questions that you have. Um, I do see one question about where do you find the thread change. Um, I think what you might be asking, and if, let me know if this answers your question or not, um, when it comes to thread changes, how do you find the information about where, what thread colors um, are in a design and, and when the thread colors change so you know what colors to use on your design? Um, with our collections, um, let me go to that Garden Couture as an example. If you'll go to the collection page, you will see a link that says preview sewing information for. Now, you won't find these on the individual design pages, but you will always find them on the collection pages. So when we go to that, you can say preview sewing information for. You click that, and that's going to open up the uh, sewing information for that collection. So this way you can see the recommended colors and you'll see those colors listed here and in addition to those recommended colors it'll tell you what is stitching so the placement stitch the tack down and the line work um, this will allow you to change it oh good question okay um, so in the software let me open that back up our sizer So the question is, um, how do you change the colors? Where is that in the software to change it for printing a darker color? Let me just open that art sizer back up, and I will show you. OK, we'll open up a design. And let me change the view. No, oh, I don't want needle points. Uh, thread colors are under settings, and then thread colors. And that's where you'll see these are the three thread colors in the design. And then from here, you can choose your chart. And then you choose the color you want to change it to. And it will change it right there. So again, that was under settings and then thread colors.
Um, another question is, where on a garment can you use a heavier fill? So typically where you want to put a heavier fill on a garment is going to be a place where the body can support it. So if you think about, for example, a chest design, a left chest design, it's going to sit on such a place that it actually is resting against the body and it doesn't need to flow or move around. Shoulders are another area where you can put a little bit heavier design because it's being supported by the body. But then think about a hem. You typically are going to want to avoid putting too heavy of a design on a hem because it's not leaning against the body, it's not supported, and so it's having to flow free. Um, and if you don't, if you put a heavy design in the area that's designed to flow free, it won't flow free because it's got those stitches in the way. And, um, and so it will create some awkward stiffness sometimes. So you want to typically keep the heavier fill areas to things like shoulder placement, um, chest, uh, jacket backs, things of that nature where there's really a lot of support. If you want to do a fairly heavy design on jeans, um, typically you're going to want to put that on the thigh or the back pocket area as opposed to a hem, unless the hem of the jeans, uh, the pant leg of the jeans is fairly uh, snug. If you've got a boot cut, you typically don't want to put a real heavy design around the boot cut. Uh, the question of the couture designs, there are actually two of them. Uh, the question is, what's the name of those couture designs? There are two of them. Um, one is called Floral Couture, and it's number 12450, Floral Couture. And the other one is called Garden Couture, and it's number 12461. So the dress designs are from this Garden Couture collection. And then the designs from this skirt are from Floral Couture. So you could actually search for this word couture, and you'd find both of those collections on Embroidery Online. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions. Another question, how can you find the recorded seminars? We will send you a link to the recorded seminars. Um, you can also find them, and we'll send you this link at embroideryonline.com. It's T dash webinar archives. And we will be emailing you this link so you can find these. This is also where you can find uh, links to future webinars. So when we have new webinars, we announce this, uh, we announce them here on this page. And we'll be putting a link to this page on the main page soon. Uh, we don't currently have a link from the main page to this page, but we will be sending you this link out. You can um, see the previous webinars here. Um, you can actually watch them via GoToWebinar. You can download them to your computer. Um, you can watch them on YouTube. And we've got three, uh, three previous webinars, and this will be up in the next couple of days. Oh, what a great question. Uh, the question is, I'm thinking of embroidering a design on the thigh of jeans and would like to use metallics. Um, what tips do you have for me? Uh, metallics actually usually perform pretty well on uh, denim. Um, denim is a fabric that can tolerate them. Um, metallic fabrics can act, metallic threads can actually be kind of tough on your fabric. I mean, if you think about it, you're, you're stitching um, little pieces of metal into your fabric. So it doesn't usually like a really lightweight fabric. It prefers something like denim. Um, um, so you, you should be fine there. Um, just be sure you use a nice uh, heavy needle, so at least a size 90, um, and that will both accommodate the larger eye for the metallic thread and also the thickness of your jeans. Uh, when it comes to stitching on the thigh of jeans, you're going to want to be sure you look at the seams before you start stitching. You're going to probably have to take part of a seam out. So again, be sure you're looking for... Um, a flat fell seam. Some pair, some jeans have a flat fell seam on both sides, and in that in that case, you you'll have to take one of the flat fell seams out um, in order to stitch on it. Um, if not, you want to look and see. Sometimes the inner thigh has a flat fell seam and the outer has a regular seam, or sometimes it's the reverse. So whichever side does not have a flat fell seam is going to be much easier to stitch, and then you can 
just take that part out. And you don't have to take the whole leg out. That's sometimes something that we tend to do is when we're taking the stitching out, we take out a lot more than we really need to. Just take out far enough to be able to lay the fabric flat. Now, in most, I should say that you'll have to take the seam out in most cases, um, depending on the size of the jeans. If the jeans are big enough, sometimes you can actually kind of come in through the waistline and get to the thigh, but most of the time you'll have to take, um, you'll have to take part of the seam out of the thigh. But you just need to open it wide enough in order to lay it flat onto your stabilizer. Hold just a moment. <coughs> Pardon me, I got a little cough. Um, if you're going to be embroidering across the seam, that's one area where you do want to be sure um, if, for example, you're going to embroider across the outer seam. Make sure when you're stitching if that seam has a fold to it, so if it folds to the back or folds to the front, just make sure it's consistent all the way how you want that to be um, before you start embroidering because you don't want it for it to be flipped in the middle because that creates extra bulk. So if that seam tends to be um, press towards the back, just make sure that it's entirely pressed towards the back under the entire area that's going to be embroidered. And when you're stitching through that thickest area where you've got the, the seam in that area, um, you just really want to be sure you're right there with the machine so that you can watch for any problems. Um, if the needle starts to pop, you might have to put in a bright, uh, brand new fresh needle when you're stitching that seam area just because it is so much thickness there. Um, so just being careful, watching what you're doing, and uh, you should be pretty successful. And if you do get that project done, I'd love to see a picture of it. Well, thank you all for your kind words. I've enjoyed having you in class as well. I'm going to stay on the line for just another couple of minutes. If you have additional questions, you will be receiving an email in the next, um, you should actually get one today, probably automatically from GoToWebinar, and then you'll receive one from us in the next couple of days with the webinar recording, should be up uh, within 48 hours. And you can just reply to that email um, that comes to you uh, uh, that has my email address. You can. Uh, provide additional questions, feel free to contact us with those, and um, we'll be happy to answer them. Well, one more question comes through. Where, where can you get Artsizer? Artsizer is available free from our website. So if you go to embroideryonline.com, you will see a link at the top of the page that says software. You'll see a link that says software. From there, you can click on that link. And then click, you'll see the OESD Artsizer comes up. And there will be a link that comes up here that says free download. Just click this free download and it will download a zip file and then you can install it from that zip file. P.S. I should have told um, everyone there are a few free designs in that art sizer when you download it too, so an extra little motivation to download it. Okay, well, it's 10 after, so I'm going to go ahead and log off, um, and I am going to address any additional questions and um, uh, by email, so please feel free to drop me an email. Uh, we do have severe weather here in Oklahoma today, so any of you who are in the area or in the path of severe weather, please stay safe today, and thanks again so much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next time.